Hi there, everyone. Welcome to The Daily Gardener. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's July 31st. Did you know that poppies were Christopher Lloyd's favorite flower? In his short essay about poppies, he introduces Goliath poppies, which grow to four feet tall and offer the largest blooms of any poppy. Lloyd wrote about the blooms, saying they are rich crimson, which is as exciting as scarlet. In choosing plant neighbors to vie with it, I have been best pleased with an equally bright and pure yellow giant buttercup, Ranunculus acris stevinii. It is, however, shocking to discover that there are some gardeners and non-gardeners of congenitally weak and palsied constitution who do not like strong colors and who even pride themselves as a class apart on their good taste. The Good Taste Brigade can only think comfortably in terms of color harmonies and of soft and soothing pest shades. Oh, how it pains the heart to be called out like that by Christopher Lloyd, doesn't it? Well, even though he thinks we're too meek when it comes to color in the garden, we're in violent agreement when it comes to procurement. You'll love this little snippet about how he came to own the poppy beauty queen. I took a fancy to Beauty Queen in a friend's garden in Scotland in June when it was flowering and received permission to take a piece. When you see a plant that you must have, the answer to the question, would you like some at the right time, should be, I'd rather have it now, right time or not. Otherwise, the right time will surely slip by. The transference of the coveted piece from central Scotland to the south of England or from California to Maine will be inconvenient and all you'll have is a gnawing gap in the pit of your wish world. Here is today's brevities. It was on this day in 1703 that Daniel Defoe was made to stand in the pillory in front of the temple bar. The pillory was basically a stockade. The hands and head would be caught between two large beams of wood. It was horrible, and it was usually reserved for the most hideous crimes. When Defoe was convicted of sedition, the crowds did their best to show support. They threw flowers at his feet instead of mud. And it's the birthday of Mary Vox Walcott, born in Philadelphia today in 1860. Gardeners know Walcott for her work as a botanical illustrator. She meticulously created watercolors of plants and flowers, and she's known as the Audubon of Botany. Walcott became an illustrator after being challenged to paint a rare blooming arnica. Although her effort was just a modest success, it encouraged her to pursue the art. In that pursuit, she met Charles Doolittle Walcott. They were both doing field work, and they found they were equally yoked. They married the following year. At the time, Charles was the secretary of the Smithsonian, and that's how Walcott came to develop the Smithsonian process printing technique. Walcott's five-volume set entitled North American Wildflowers showcases the stunning beauty of everyday wildflowers, many of which are at peak bloom right now. And today's the anniversary of the death of Richard Morris Hunt, who was an American architect during the Gilded Age. In the world of horticulture, Hunt is known for his collaborations with Frederick Law Olmsted. They worked together on the Vanderbilt Mausoleum and the Chicago World's Fair. Their ultimate collaboration occurred in Asheville, North Carolina, where they worked together to design the gardens, house, and village for the Biltmore Estate. Hunt is often recognized as the Dean of American Architecture, 
Although Hunt and Olmsted had history, they clashed over Hunt's design for the southern entrance to Central Park. Hunt had won the competition to design it, but Olmsted and Vox rejected Hunt's glorious design. Ironically, in 1898, a memorial was created in Central Park to honor Richard Morris Hunt. And it was created by the same man who created the monument to Abraham Lincoln, Daniel Chester French. And it was on this day in 1972 that the horticulture program at the Smithsonian Gardens was established by Sidney Dillon Ripley. An American ornithologist and conservationist, Ripley had been inspired by the area around the Louvre in France. In 2010, the horticultural program was renamed the Smithsonian Gardens to recognize the role that the gardens play in the visitor experience. In Unearthed Words, here's a poem by Robert Frost called Lodged. This is a short garden poem. In six little lines, Frost connects himself to the flowers, pelted by wind and rain, yet through it all, managing to survive. The rain to the wind said, you push and I'll pelt. They so smote the garden bed that the flowers actually knelt and lay lodged, though not dead. I know how the flowers felt. Today's book recommendation is Gardenista, The Definitive Guide to Stylish Outdoor Spaces by Michelle Slatala. Slatala's book was named the best gift book for gardeners by the New York Times. For today's garden chore, check for overcrowding and overall areas of meh in your garden. Garden chores tend to get pushed aside this time of year, but it's worth spending a little time this week looking closely at the overall appearance of your beds, borders, and containers. Take your camera with you to document what you see. If the beds are both crowded and unattractive, you probably need to do a little bit of pruning and transplanting to whip those beds into shape for the remainder of the season. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today is National Avocado Day. Avocado is a fruit, and it was originally called an alligator pear by Sir Hans Sloan. Don't forget that the skin of an avocado can be toxic to cats and dogs, but the flesh is actually higher in potassium than bananas. And finally, the conquistadors used avocado seeds to write. It turns out that the avocado seed produces a milky liquid that changes to the color red when exposed to air. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced weekdays in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. You can find complete show notes over at thedailygardener.org and be sure to share the show with your garden friends. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and of course, Facebook. While you're over at Facebook, don't forget to join The Daily Gardener community. Just search for these three words, Daily Gardener Community. The group will pop right up and then request to join. Finally, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, where my fabulous editor is Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.